Blog Talk Radio. Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. Broadcasting Live presents Two Guys and a Bible with Don Preston and William Bell. Join us each week at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central as we bring you exciting, sound, challenging, and comforting messages regarding the end times. Thank you for tuning in today. Don Preston is the founder of Preterist Research Institute, or PRI. Dunn is a prolific author, having written and published 19 books, a host of audio and DVD studies, and is a debater and defender of the full preterist view. His websites are BibleProphecy.com, Eschatology.org, and DonKPreston.com. William Bell is the founder of AllThingsFulfilled.com Ministries and has a website bearing the same name, and has authored three books, audios and DVDs. He has published hundreds of articles and recordings. And now, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Two Guys in a Bible broadcast with Don Preston and William Bell. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Two Guys in a Bible right here on Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. I'm William Bell, and with me is our co-host, Dr. Don K. Preston. And shortly we'll be underway with another study. And uh, analysis of the Word of God, probably some updates and reports on the latest of what's been going on in both of our worlds. And um, uh, following that, we'll get down to some serious Bible study. So let's uh, let's get to the important stuff first. How about that, Don? <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's talk about well, what you have for dinner, right, or what you're going to eat yeah, for dinner. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, what I'm about to have for dinner is really it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, listen. All right. I've, Go ahead. I, I've got to share something here. Uh, on Thursday of our conference just recently, I, we were in the midst of all of this incredible preparation, you know, the logistical details, as you know, as we were talking before going on the air. You, there are just so many details that go into organizing a a conference. Well, okay, on Thursday, we were just hectically involved, and my cell phone rings. And it was a number that I did not recognize. And I have to tell you, I've gotten to the point, if I do not recognize the number, I'm probably not going to answer it because of all the spam phone calls. If uh, my philosophy is, and and if anyone is listening that has tried to contact me and I haven't answered, leave a voice message. That, That way I know that it's legitimate. So anyway, it rang and it rang and it rang. And finally I go, well, okay, whatever. I answered the phone, and this uh, this lady says, is this Don K. Preston? And I thought, oh, boy, here we go. This is going to be spam. I said, yes, ma'am, it is. And she said, uh, is your email? And she rattled off my email. And I'm going, yeah, okay, yes, ma'am, it is. And she said, well, do you remember filling out a uh, contest form at Santa Fe Steakhouse on Father's Day. <laughs> and I said, contest for what? And she said, for a Yeti ice cooler full of meat. And I go, no, ma'am, I have to be really honest. I have no recollection of that. And she said, well, you won. And I was like, do what? <laughs> I've never won anything in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and she goes ahead and explains and everything. Well, okay, that was back in July. Here we are in August. And it kind of drug on, drug on. Long story short, we go to the Santa Fe Steakhouse last night, and they presented us with a Yeti ice cooler full of Santa Fe steaks. I'm talking everything from fillets to T-bones to strips to you name it. And I was like, wow, is this cool or what? (laughs) Yeah, that's good. So that's my story tonight. All right. Well, that's awesome. I can't top that. (laughs) (laughs) That is very, very cool. You know me and the heat. (laughs) Huh? 
and say, you know me oh, and that? my meat. Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, I uh, spent the weekend in South Carolina, and um, the them asked me to come out and share some information on speaking in tongues, you know, the charismata and various other eschatological themes. And so we went out that I went out Thursday of last week and got there a little tired and exhausted, but I spent some time with um, their minister, and um, we found out we had a lot of things in common based on a lot of the videos we watch on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> so we had, had, had a real good conversation about that late into the night. I think it was 12-something when we finished. Cool. And then, uh, so the next day... Um, we started around six o'clock and then probably left there around 10. And that was speaking straight through. Well, not straight through. I took, I think one or two breaks in the middle, but uh, just four hours and people were sit, sitting there just taking it all in. So it was a really, really good meeting. And then on that Saturday, we went about uh, maybe 150 miles or so to another church where we just taught preachers, and um, wow. that turned out to be really, really good. So um, they're doing some good work out there, and they're getting some guys that are not just learning. They're out there teaching and sharing the information. So yes. it, was, um, it was very good. They were very excited. You know, there were people saying they were coming to the um, Memphis Eschatology Seminar, and, um, you know, they wanted books and and tapes and things. So they were, um, they were just fired up. And, and of course, you know, it was, it was very enjoyable to be out there. And then uh, the last day, you know, we spent time just kind of socializing a bit. Uh, we went bowling and um, to the museum and just kind of hung out for a while and, and enjoyed ourselves on the last day. But That's um, cool. yeah, yeah. So it was really nice. Theo and Jaina, and and their whole church, man, was just um, really, really very hospitable and very kind, uh, very um, you know supportive in every single way. Uh, so it was a, it was a great experience to be um, to be in an environment like that uh, after um, you know for so long being away from something like that. So that was good. Yeah, good experience. The, it. They really are just a fantastic group of people out there and very excited. It's it's always great to be able to be with them. And uh, and it's great to hear uh, Theo and Jaina when they give us reports. You know, we happen to see them at seminars and what have you. But I know it's just really fantastic to be there with them. Uh, when you when you talk about their hospitality, I mean that's an understatement. They are just absolutely fantastic when it comes to hospitality and making a person feel welcome and uh, and appreciated. So I know you thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed that trip. Had to have. Oh yeah, it was great. It was great. Well, it's been a very very hectic week here so far. I've been involved in doing some. Some research, uh, some writing. I'm currently writing an article. Uh, I've, I've been working on this article for about two months now because I want to be ultra careful, ultra cautious, ultra conservative uh, in the way that I present the article. But the, uh, the title of the article will be Why Right is Wrong. And it will be uh, an examination and a critique of N.T. Wright's uh, eschatology. So uh, I, what I am doing is documenting with quotes from N.T. Wright's writings about what, he's, what he says about eschatology, what he says, for instance, about the entire Jewish eschatological narrative. And what I mean by that is uh, the Jews believe that in the critical last days you would have the appearance of Elijah, uh, you would have the return of the Holy Spirit, the prophetic office, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to raise Israel from the dead. Pardon me. Uh, you would have the Great Tribulation, which would lead to uh, the judgment, the coming of the Lord, the resurrection, and the kingdom. And what is absolutely fascinating is that you can document from N.T. Wright's writings where he believes that every single one 
of those elements was present in the first century. He believes that John the Baptizer was Elijah, as, for instance, I develop in my book, Elijah Has Come, uh, a, a, a solution to Romans 11, 25 to 27. He believes that the prophetic uh, office had been was restored in the first century and was for the purpose of raising Israel from the dead. He believes that the Great Tribulation was in the first century. He believes that the end of the age occurred in A.D. 70. So with, with all of those things present, you can only wonder how and why N.T. Wright still holds to a futurist eschatology, and yet he does. He, he violates every eschatological tenet that he sets forth as fulfilled and yet holds to, uh, and by violating what he says about those eschatological tenets, then he still posits a future eschatology, which is self-contradictory. Uh, it's just not tenable uh, based upon the comments that he is on record as writing in all of his books. So, again, the, uh, the, the title of my article is Why Right is Wrong. And uh, it'll be a while, I'm sure, before it's completely finished. But it, it will be, I hope, a very effective and a very powerful uh, article to demonstrate how modern scholarship – Indeed, some of the greatest modern scholarship available to anyone uh, is seeing the eschatological significance of the fulfillment uh, <clears throat> of Israel's promises in the first century, even climaxing in A.D. 70, and yet then the inconsistency to posit an eschatology beyond that climactic event which they themselves posit. So anyway, that's kind of what I'm working on. Been been involved in a in a lot of really great correspondence with people from around the world, and uh, having just a a really really great time. Still getting a lot of really great feedback uh, about my debate with David Hester, which by the way I sent him an email today inquiring about a second debate. He said that Faulkner University will not sponsor one on campus. And I cannot say that I'm a bit surprised about that, obviously. But nonetheless, he said he is checking into uh, another venue, and he'll see about how that develops. So I, I will be waiting to hear from David Hester about the possibility of the second debate there in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, at a neutral location. We'll keep everyone informed about whether or not that uh, that agreement comes to fruition but anyway yeah like i said you know some very uh, let me exciting things say something right ahead. there yes um when i think about the fact that you have an institution of learning higher learning that engages men and helps men to develop to be their very best at articulating and proclaiming the word of god that they have an opportunity to put on display, and not I'm using that word loosely, but to present two sides of a very um, important and vital topic that people are no doubt interested in, and they refuse to have it on campus. I'm sure that they would have, you know, lesser important discussions or at least discussions that um, would be no greater than that and opportunities for students to hear and to see. But we really have to question the viability of some of these places that call themselves institutions of learning, and yet it seems that they go beyond to ensure that people do not get a chance to learn by simply trying to control their thinking. I'm not saying there are any motives behind what, what that is, but to me it would be a situation where they should be jumping on the opportunity to have such a discussion that would provide such a unique experience for the students there. That's just my opinion. Well, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, I agree with that 100%. 
and especially given the background of the Churches of Christ, uh, to welcome debate on virtually any subject. That uh, that is a humongous element of the history of the Churches of Christ. And <clears throat> pardon me, uh, we both both know about that, and yet William. We've seen it over and over and over again. For instance, right there, although it's not what could properly be called an institution of higher learning, but nonetheless, the, the Memphis School of Preaching is an institution that, that heralds itself as the champion and the defender of biblical truth. They, For all practical purposes' sake, they would claim that they are the only true bastion of truth uh, in many respects. We both know that they have there on campus, sponsored by them, they have mock debates on controversial issues. You and I both know they've had mock debates on covenant eschatology between students. And yet, some years ago, when given the opportunity to promote your debate with Stephen Wiggins, one of their so-called heroes, they not only refused to promote it, they told any students that were threatening to go to the debate that there would be consequences, severe consequences, if they went to the debate. And so we have seen this scenario play out over and over and over again, in which, as you note, uh, institutions of higher education, institutions and organizations that claim to be proclaimers and defenders of, God, of God's truth. And you would think, William, to add this additional thought, you would think that if they believed that David Hester had done such a great job of defeating covenant eschatology right here, in my backyard, you would think that they would want to sponsor him on their campus for him to, quote, blow me away, unquote, again in front of their students. Let their students see how easy it is to defeat covenant eschatology. But instead... No, they do not want a debate on covenant eschatology on campus to encourage the students to attend. They want it off campus somewhere else. And so, again, I agree with you 100%. I, I believe this is very, very telling uh, of an institution whose one of their own professors – who, by the way, organizes their yearly Faulkner University lectureship. He's in charge of that. And yet, he could not persuade them, or he could not organize himself to have a debate on covenant eschatology on campus. Now, Again, that, that just really, really is revealing. And it makes you wonder, William, you know, at what used to be called OCC in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma Christian College, it's now Oklahoma Christian University. And they have had, Abilene Christian University has had, men such as Richard Hayes and some others that traditionally speaking – the churches of Christ would not even recognize as Christian brothers. But they, they would consider them outsiders. And yet, both o OCU and Abilene have had Richard Hayes as highly respected, highly appreciated, greatly admired scholars to come speak to their students. Now, I don't know, and I just I freely confess that I do not. I do not know if Faulkner University has ever sponsored 
such lectureships before, in which world-renowned scholars who are not members of the Churches of Christ have been invited to speak. So uh, I'm admitting my ignorance on this. But if they had, and if they have, then it certainly raises some red flags, at least in my mind. So that would essentially say, okay, so you're willing to bring men who are not members of the churches of Christ with whom you would have severe differences in regard to soteriology and probably in regard to eschatology and almost assuredly in regard to ecclesiology, and I can guarantee you in regard to pneumatology. So you would disagree with these men on all of those tenets, and yet you would invite them on campus to speak to your students, but you would not sponsor a debate between one of your, quote, esteemed professors, unquote, and a member of the Church of Christ who agrees with you in large part on soteriology and ecclesiology and pneumatology. We just differ on eschatology. And needless to say, as you and I know, there's an interweaving and an, and an interwoven connection between all of these other issues. But there are not dramatic differences between us in regard to those elements. So you're right. I mean, it raises all sorts of red flags to say, wait a minute, you're a Christian university. You're an institution of higher learning. You're an institution that is dedicated to teaching students to think analytically, to think critically, to think logically. And you will not submit, you will not agree to have a debate that would challenge the students to think analytically, that would challenge the students to think logically, that would challenge the students to, pro to practice good, solid hermeneutic and exegesis. But you won't do that. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's fascinating to say the very, very least. Yeah, well, sure it is. Um, <clears throat> however, uh, you know, all you can do sometimes is take the opportunities that are before you and then hope that through the providence of God, the word, you know, spreads to where it needs to go. And, of course, that's done and being done. And so, um, you know, we just go ahead like that. It's just sad to see it, you know, from that perspective. Um, so many people have engaged in discussions uh, over and over again. And, um, I mean, it's just... It, it's always good to hear the other side of any um, of, of any view where people are honestly setting forth what they believe and they're doing it in a respect, you know, respectful way. So I can't see where that can be, you know, damaging or harmful to anyone. But I think what it will do is it would set a terrible precedent for them uh, if one were to start and um, they might be concerned about, okay, now where is this going to end up? You know, let's go to the next university and the next one, um, <laughs> and, and, let, and let's, um, you know, let's get these discussions out. But I think, it, you know, I mean, how long can people run from, uh, from these issues and stand and pontificate to a certain degree that, you know, we're it, we've got all the truth, and anything else beyond us is error, and, uh, and yet be unwilling to defend it, so... We'll see what happens down the road. I hope that the second debate will uh, come off uh, with uh, David Hester, and hopefully he'll be more uh, informed, better informed in terms of what the issues are, and will make better arguments um, regarding them, and at the same time give other people an opportunity to um, to really see the distinctions between uh, between the views uh, as they, you know, as best as they possibly can while they're sitting in the audience. But you know, we know that from our experience at Tulsa. Uh, many in the churches of Christ are not even familiar with the um, uh, the arguments related to eschatology or to eschatology, period. And then if you think about it, if uh, Four Wallace hadn't have debated, uh, you know, uh, Neil, and um, uh, I don't know if he debated R.H. Bold, did he debate him as well? I don't remember if 
uh, if Wallace debated Bowles, to be honest about it. That, that's a good okay. question. Yeah, but at any rate, um, we know that if there had not been discussions back during that time, uh, the church would still be premillennial to this day, more than likely. That's right. I mean, you that's know, right. and you go all the way back to Alexander Campbell and look at some of the influences of it. So they've got some, some history to deal with, and um, I don't think they're too proud of today when people point it out. <laughs> I think I think you're exactly correct on that. Yes. Yes. All right. So what's the uh what's the topic? Uh I know last week we were following up on some of the points um of the debate between you and um David Hester. I uh, didn't know whether you wanted to continue that a little bit this week or move on and delve into another topic. We had tossed around first Peter, but I understand that you're going to be doing uh, dear, DVD series on uh, First I am. Peter. Okay. I'm, I'm very um, excited so. about this, William. I'm going to be doing a thematic uh, commentary on First Peter. And it, as I mentioned last week, it will be a subscription uh, study. And uh, right now I have about 15 to 16 themes from the book of First Peter that I intend to develop, and, and that's just those are just the topics right off the top of my head that I have uh, that I've listed. I, I'm, there will be more. There'll probably be a grand total of 20, perhaps as many as 25 uh, themes from the book of First Peter that I intend to cover in this DVD study. And I put an announcement of it on my Facebook page, and I'm very, very gratified uh, at the response to it so far. And how the word has spread, how people have contacted me and said, let me know how to sign up. I'm all in for this, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm, uh, I'm excited about the response to that. We're going to make it just as affordable as possible uh, so that there won't be a lot of expense involved. But uh, we, it will be by, Bill, it will be by uh, subscription. And uh, those who subscribe will be getting, getting some extra benefits and what have you. So we are we're not going to do that. But I thought what we would do, and here we are halfway into the program for this evening, on my Facebook uh page, William, uh actually on another page, uh, a discussion has been going on, and as is usually the case, resurrection is the topic of discussion. And Philippians chapter three seems to be at least in this one particular discussion uh, that was going on today. And the the argument was made. I, I'm going to read from the the I'm going to read from the good old King James and I will tell you how this individual, one particular individual, with some others chiming in in agreement as if it were, shall we say, the inspired translation that this one person had given. But in Philippians chapter 3, starting with verse 20, Paul said, Our conversation is in heaven, from which also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Now, this one individual who was ostensibly quoting the text quoted it like this. Speaking of Christ, said, Who shall change our vile bodies, plural, that they may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things, even unto himself. And this individual was claiming this text is emphatic. This is talking about the human physical body, the body's plural uh, of man. Every woman, every man will receive uh, their body, even if it's gone into the grave. It will be raised and it will be transformed into an immortal, incorruptible body, and they say 
just like Jesus' physical body was transformed at his resurrection. So, William, give us a, a little bit of commentary on Philippians chapter 3 and the claim that Paul is talking about the transformation of every human physical body, in other words, bodies plural, being transformed into Jesus' glorious resurrection body. Well, you know, it's amazing how many people approach the scriptures with their, I'm going to say their preconceived uh, notions or based on a conclusion they've already reached. Uh, instead of allowing the text to speak to them. And, um, you know, anytime you're going to read Philippians 3, I think, you know, it should be read from as though you're reading it the first time until, until something clicks. But, you know, what you have in Philippians 3 is Paul discussing the worship of God in the spirit compared to that which is in the flesh. And he talks about the circumcision and those who worship him in the spirit, as opposed to worshiping according to the flesh, even though if he wanted to boast about the flesh, he could do so. But he said he gave all of that up for Christ. Now, his purpose for giving it up is found beginning in verse 9. Well, it's actually stated in the earlier verses because it says that he may gain Christ. But he begins to expound upon that and explain it a little bit in terms of uh, the end goal, and sort of expands on it. So he says that he wanted to be found in him. Now, as I understand it, the word found is a technical term for the parousia. It has to do with, um, um, you know, eschatological concepts. So he's already indicating something here when he says that he wanted to be found in him, not having his own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through the faith in Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And his aim was to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. Now, Paul was in the process of being conformed to the death of Christ, but he wasn't in the grave. And um, in that conformity, he would likewise be... Um, or attain to the resurrection of the dead. He was in the process of doing so. Uh, this is a point that, you know, we've talked about several times, and you'll find it in Acts chapter 4, verse 2, and you'll also find it here in Philippians. They don't state it exactly the same way. You have a different word here in Philippians, but the concept is the same. Uh, in Acts 4, they are grieved that the apostles are teaching a resurrection out from the dead ones, out from among the dead ones. Well, if the dead ones are the dead ones, just to play on the words a little bit, if they are the ones who are in Hades and you have a resurrection going on out from among them, then it's certainly not raising those who are out from among them from literal graves, which is generally what people are talking about when they want to talk about the uh, transformation of the body in Philippians 3 and verse 20 and 21. So he's saying, if by any means I might attain to the exonestation, the resurrection out from among the dead, which means that there was resurrection going on or taking place out from among the dead ones, and Paul was participating in that, being a living, breathing individual. And so in verse 12, he says, Not as though I had already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold on me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, in verses uh, 20 and 21, when he says, um, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body. 
that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. The term here used for the uh, transformation of the lowly body is the word that's used for the humiliation of Christ when he came in the flesh. And when he did so, he suffered um, in terms of uh, humanity, suffering under death. But one interesting point that's made is that the humbling of Christ occurred beforehand. If you look at Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, because the text says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. So if we're going to take a springboard off the word, I think it's taponosis. If I'm not sure if that's the actual pronunciation of the term, but that's the term. If we're going to use that in the text, it's not speaking of Christ's resurrection from the dead. It's talking about something that occurred with him prior to his resurrection. In other words, it was his it was his humbled, incarnation. He humbled himself. He was in the form of God. He laid off the form of God, became man. Exactly, exactly. And so to use it in the text from the perspective that they're using it is um, is not really accurate. Uh, and you can, if you do a study on that word, you will see in other passages where it's used um, has nothing. It, you know, it simply talks about a state of humility. Now, what was going on is during the time of the transition and transformation from the old covenant to the new, the saints were in a state of humiliation. They were being persecuted. They were being maligned in terms of the names they were being called. Uh, they, their goods, you know, personal possessions were being destroyed. Their homes were being destroyed. They were being chased from city to city, etc. So, and, and they were claiming to be of one who was crucified and considered to be a blasphemer. So they were in a state of humility as the body of Christ. And just as Christ had overcome, you know, that period of humbling himself uh, where he humbled himself and became obedient unto death and then uh, rose in the realm of the spirit to his state of glory. He's telling them that they likewise, when Christ appeared, would also be manifested in glory such as he was. But again, this is not focusing on their individual uh, bodies. In other words, a personal transformation of individual bodies this is focusing on the entire body of christ that was suffering that humiliation and of course the shame um concept and uh, motif is a big part of that anytime uh if you have a nation or individuals who are being defeated there was this concept of shame and humiliation and that's what it appeared to be at the time that they were going through it however uh once the um the parousia occurred, uh, there would be this separation from the temple, from Judaism, from the enemies of God, which he had also spoken about in Philippians 3, and the vic victory of the church would be manifested, would be seen, and that's basically what would occur. Now, that isn't the only thing that was happening. There were things definitely occurring on the, um, on the um, post-life level, you know, where uh, in the realm of the dead ones for sure, because they were being released from Hades. But again, all of that was taking place in terms of the body of Christ, whereas individuals are participating in it, but it's not focused on their individual bodily transformation in terms of their biological makeup. You know, you, you raised an awful lot of absolutely fantastic points here. Uh, and one of them is that we've, we've, and we've talked about this on this program before, William, but I, it is a concept that far too few people are truly familiar with when it comes to understanding so many of the motifs, so many of the themes, 
and elements that are discussed in the New Testament, and that is shame versus glory. Uh, again, we've discussed it on this program, but in the ancient world, there was such an incredible sense uh, that it, if you had been, as a nation, defeated in battle, you were in the dust. You were dead. You were in shame. But if you returned from that conflict, if you returned to your homeland, if you returned to your city, if you returned to your God, you were raised from the dead. That was your glorification. That was your vindication. And uh, again, th this is a motif that today we are not sufficiently familiar with. Uh, you cited, pardon me, Colossians chapter 3, where Paul said, if then you be uh, dead with Christ, then seek those things which are above. Set your affection on things above, not on things that are on the earth. For when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. And that does not mean, in spite of the modern view of a rapture, in spite of the modern view of people being snatched up all the, uh, off the earth and being seen by the people who are going to be left behind, th this is exaltation language that speaks of those who have been downtrodden, those who have been uh, persecuted, those who have been ostracized, those who have been hated. And now their cause, their name, their very existence has been vindicated by the one that they serve. And we see this in Romans chapter 8 tremendously, where we see Paul talking about those whom God called, he glorified. And yet he was waiting for glory. And this, this transitional period, uh, a, a time of transition from shame, uh, a, a transitional period of time from the immature man to that which was waiting for glory. It, it amazes me how quickly people reject that concept, seemingly without thinking it through very much at all. But this transitional period of time is so incredibly, incredibly important for us to understand. And we can talk about the typology of David uh, to prove this. You know, David was anointed king 40 years almost before he ever took the throne, or however many years it was. Well, Jesus was anointed king at his baptism. How many years before his actual enthronement? That's a transitional period of time. Was David known as King David prior to his enthronement? Of course he was. Just like Jesus came to be king and was anointed again at his baptism. So th there's so much that goes into this. And you look, well, go back and look at David. What happened to David during that time after he was anointed king. Well, Saul chased him all over the countryside trying to kill him. And certainly scholars down through the centuries have noticed the direct parallels, uh, the type and the antitype between David and Jesus. And, and to fail to see the type, the antitype between David and Jesus is to miss some of the beauty of the story of Jesus himself. So here's Jesus who's been anointed. He has been called the Son of God. Uh, again, he's been anointed as a king. But what happens? He is hated. He is reviled. He's rejected. He is slain. But he is raised from the dead. He is enthroned. Enthroned where? On the, on the throne of David. This is not accidental language. This is not coincidental language. This is language that calls our attention back to the type and the antitype of David as the type of Christ as the antitypical fulfillment of David the king 
of Israel. So all of those things that you said play directly into what we are talking about. And by the way, folks, right here in Philippians chapter 3, it's so amazing to me, and this happens so very, very often. When people discuss resurrection, Philippians chapter 3, what do they do? Well, they jump to verse 21. But they, they miss the grammatical continuity of, of Paul's discussion of the contrast between Old Covenant Israel and New Covenant Israel. As William pointed out a few moments ago, in Philippians chapter 3, Paul writes to the church at, at Philippi and he says, Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. Now, most scholars agree that Paul coined a term there because it's not known in any Greek literature before Philippians chapter 3. And it is believed that Paul is referring to circumcision here in a derogatory manner to call attention to the fact that physical circumcision no longer avails anything as far as as those who are now followers of Christ. And he says, we, we who? Followers of Christ. We are the circumcision. Those of us who worship God in the spirit, we rejoice in Jesus Christ. We put no confidence in the flesh. This is the context of Paul's contrast all the way through chapter 3 as he contrasts his former life under Torah with his life to struggle to come out from under Torah, and as William pointed out, to be found in Christ, not having his own righteousness, which is through the law and by works, but through the righteousness of faith in Jesus Christ. And he says, so I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in, in Christ Jesus. And by the way, he says, not that I have already attained. Attained unto what? Perfection. Attained unto what? The resurrection. Well, of course he hadn't attained unto the resurrection if the resurrection is the raising of biological bodies out of the grave. How silly would that be for Paul to say something like that? <laughs> I never will forget how that struck me the first time I saw that, how impossible it would be to take the physical view of resurrection when Paul says, it's my desire to know the power of Christ's resurrection, that he was even then, currently, being made conformable to Christ's death. And as William Sewell pointed out a moment ago, it's pretty obvious Paul wasn't being made conformable to the physical death of Jesus. No, we, we have to look deeper. We have to look closer at the text. So I... I I'm saying all of that to say this, all the way up to verse 20, what do we have? We have a contrast between the old covenant world and the new covenant world. And notice specifically verse 19, whose end, whose end? The Jews, who have become the enemies of the cross. And folks, by the way, that has its, uh, this language here has its roots all the way back in Isaiah chapter 60. This language of becoming the enemy of God, even in the last days, finds its roots in the book of Lamentations. It finds its roots in the book of Micah, where every time that Israel refused Yahweh's call. They were said to become the enemy of God. And here in Philippians chapter 3, Paul is contrasting those who are followers of Christ with those of the old covenant circumcision that he calls concision. They have become the enemies of of Christ. Now I said all that to bring us down to verse 19, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, 
who mind earthly things. Now, you see, this ties back in with verse 2 and 3. We do not glory in the flesh. We are the circumcision, Paul said, whose circumcision is of the heart, not of the flesh. So Paul, journalistically, is tying this discussion back in with the contrast that he set forth in verse 2. So let me read this again. Whose end is their destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. And all you got to do is do a study of earthly things, and that's old covenant Israel. But anyway, now notice. Notice this, ladies and gentlemen. For that Greek particle, for, connects verse 19 with what Paul is about to say inextricably, inseparably. There, there's an unbroken bond between what Paul is about to say and what he has just said. Well, what has he been saying? What he's been saying is the contrast between Old Covenant Israel and New Covenant Israel, not a contrast between purely physical things of all humanity versus spiritual ethereal things of Jesus Christ. It is Old Covenant Israel versus New Covenant Israel. And he says, for, to continue this discussion, to continue this contrast between the Old Covenant world and the New, for our, that's the New Covenant Israel, that's the true circumcision, that's those who put no confidence in the flesh, that's those whose God is not their belly, but the things of Christ, for our manner of life, our way of living, our conversation is in heaven. Well, what's that a contrast with? Earthly things, of verse 19, that he's just mentioned. Well, once again, as I mentioned, folks, look, if you do a, con- if you do a study of this term of earthly and earthy that Paul discusses in 1 Corinthians 15, for instance, uh, the first man, Adam, was earthy, not earthly, but earthy. You will find that Paul is not talking about dirt and rocks and trees. He is talking about the physical realities of Old Covenant Israel, again, versus the New Covenant things of Jesus Christ. So here is Paul, our conversation, our manner of life, is in heaven versus the earthly things. From which also we look, and by the way, folks, have to have to point this out. Anyone who wants to talk about the resurrection of, first, uh, of Philippians chapter 3 needs to seriously, seriously consider the linguistics of Philippians 3. When, when Paul says we look, th- this Greek word is apekdekomai. And it is an eager, expectant looking. This is a word that does not denote a long, protracted, drawn-out wait. It is we are eagerly expecting to see what it is we are looking for. And so Paul says, we're looking for the Savior for heaven, who shall change our vile body. Well, what body has he been contrasting? What is the body of the text, ladies and gentlemen? It's the old covenant body of Israel versus the new covenant body of Christ. If we stick with text... There should not be an issue in identifying the body of humiliation that Paul is talking about, and it is not a biological body. William, does not the traditional view here raise issues of a, of a really strange dualism, a neg- 
I'm not going to say Gnosticism, uh, because that didn't come along until the second century, but nonetheless, a very problematic dualism. If they say, who shall change our vile body, doesn't that have Paul saying that the human body is a vile thing? It is a, it is, it is a body of humiliation? Is well, that not absolutely. what it would demand? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it would it would just basically uh, denigrate the human body and um, make it something that is totally undesirable, totally reprehensible. And that's that's generally why people feel like you know they got to get out of this evil flesh. And um, and yet you know there's nothing in, inherently evil about the body itself. It is the uh, the will or the heart of the man and his behavior that um, governs the body. And so that's the only thing that is going to determine how it responds to God. But this idea of um, looking at the body as though it's some intrinsic evil uh, situation, I mean, just think about the consequences of that for Christ coming and taking on human flesh. Uh, that, Amen. that he came, <laughs> yeah, you know, so you got some... <laughs> You got some real problems there. That's the way that they're going to interpret body. And what's interesting to me is it is very claimed, very often claimed, that preterists are themselves Gnostics because uh, the position that we take demands that we hate the the human body, that we think the human body is somehow evil or wicked, and yet they're the ones taking a position on Philippians chapter three that says the human body is a vile thing. And, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, again, the reflection upon the body of Christ is incredibly profound. That means Christ's body was itself vile. It, it, now, was it a body of humiliation? Well, certainly it was for him. But the question has to be raised, is the human body that you and I were raised with, is it a body of humiliation? When we consider it's the body that we've always had, why was it called the body of, <coughs> of humiliation for Christ, ladies and gentlemen? It was not called the body of humiliation because the human body is inherently evil. That is dualism. That's the very thing that people accuse preterists of teaching, which we do not teach. No, no. The reason it was a body of humiliation for Christ, as Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, is because, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, Greek word morphe, in the form of God, did not think that equality a thing to be grasped, to be held on to, or as N.T. Wright renders it, to be taken advantage of. But rather, he emptied himself and became in fashion as a man and was found like a servant. So when you talk about the body of humiliation of Christ, it is the body of humiliation, not because the human form is a humiliating form. It is not because the human body is a vile thing. It is only a body of humiliation in regard to Christ because of his former glory prior to his incarnation. I, I, William, to me, this gets back to the issue that we have discussed on this program. Some of the traditional views of eschatology and resurrection particularly, it seems to me, and not that we claim to be such pro, incredibly profound thinkers, but the logical implications of some of the traditional views, when you look at them in light of what the Bible actually says, you just literally have to shake your head and go, that is a theological mess. That is completely unscriptural. It's completely untenable. And you have to wonder where it came from. And by the way, William, you raised a point, and I'll only say this in closing. When you raise the issue and you claim that the human body is a body of humiliation and the human body is vile, should we not therefore 
fall into the school and into the camp of the Stoics who said the human body is intrinsically evil. It is a vile thing. Therefore, in order to purge ourselves, we must get rid of anything and everything in this world that brings us physical pleasure. We must become ascetics. Well, if not, why not? If the human body is vile intrinsically, then should we not try to purge it from that vileness? Well, if you can't purge the human body from vileness by righteous living, then what hope is there? I I mean, again, there is just incredible, incredible inconsistency in the world of futurism in regard to the, the doc, to the doctrine of resurrection. Okay, well, look, folks, we're out of time for this evening. We want to thank you again for joining us for Two Guys in a Bible right here on Fulfilled Radio, a voice you can trust. Be sure to tune again in again next week as we continue our studies from God's Word and we share insights there that gives us tremendous hope, tremendous confidence, tremendous peace of, of heart, tremendous peace of mind. And with that, I'm going to say good night and God bless. Thank you for joining the Two Guys in a Bible radio broadcast. On behalf of Don Preston and myself, we'd like to say have a very pleasant day and may God bless. Until next time, we'll see you on Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. <laughs>